Okay, thank you everybody for joining the Nautical Institute Southwest of England branch. Uh, we have a fantastic presentation from Andy Hurley uh, to, to give you today, but just a few notes. If you're not a member of the Nautical Institute, please do consider doing so. We are uh, the maritime community and uh, most of our emphasis is on best practice and sharing knowledge. And one way our branch does this in the Southwest of England is to invite guest speakers from time to time um, to present on a topic of maritime interest. And I believe this one is very interesting. It's caught a lot of attention. It's been widely advertised. And uh, it's gonna be entitled uh, the beginnings of zero carbon solutions for small commercial vessels in the UK. This has been chosen for our February Nautical Institute Southwestern England branch meeting. And I'm pleased to announce that the guest speaker will be Andy Hurley, who is a branch member. He will introduce us to what zero carbon solution aims to achieve, an explanation of the current government policy basically the aims and objectives. Where is zero carbon for commercial vessels now? And what are the challenges faced by those entering this area? Also, how, how we should progress, what is needed, what direction should we head in and what support is required? Um, we will conclude this meeting after about 45 minutes uh, with a, a Q and A session. I would ask at that point when uh, Andy brings his presentation to an end that you either click the button or wave your arms or hands enthusiastically and I'll invite you to uh, unmute. Uh, that way we, we try and uh, achieve some coordination uh, with the Q&A session. So uh, without further ado, uh, thank you very much, Andy, for, for joining us. Uh, thank you for all the guests, uh, whatever continent you're on. And I believe there's a few on vessels seagoing, like myself, I'm mid-Pacific. And uh, Andy uh, Brown has uh, said that he's on an environmental program for Shell out in the water somewhere. So. Uh, a very varied audience. So Andy, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gordon. Um, and great to see everybody here. Lovely to see so many uh, and from all over the world. Um, I'll just do a brief introduction uh, about myself, first of all. So I'm Andy Hurley. Um, I live actually not far from Plymouth. Uh, I live in, in on the other side of the river though, on the other side of the Tamar in Cornwall near Coteal, so very much local. Um, my history really is I'm a, a master, been at sea since the age of 16, um, worked deep sea uh, on banana boats with fives initially, and then in the North Sea on uh, high horsepower anchor handlers, and captain on inter-island ferries in Shetland, and then 16 years with the RNLI, the Royal National Lifeboat Institution as inspector of lifeboats, and also a regional manager in the south of England. And then in 2015, retired and decided to go sailing for a little while. So my wife and I set off for about four years and sailed our little boat down to uh, the Med and had a very lovely time down there. Um, we then returned to the UK. And, uh, I thought I'd get a, a little part-time job working for a small boat operator, uh, passenger vessel operator in Plymouth called Plymouth Boat Trips. Um, so I, my, my imagination was that I'd be driving boats for a couple of days a week and having a lovely time. Um, when I arrived, they asked me if I'd be the designated person in shore responsible for their um, methic safety management system, um, which I did. And then about four weeks later, they said, would I look after a project they were think, thinking of doing, which was to establish a fleet of uh, electric passenger vessels, which I also did. So it was a slightly different job from the two days a week and took me pretty much back to full-time work. Um, really interesting though. Um, and that's sort of how I've ended up working, uh, talking here and um, being involved in uh, zero carbon work. So I worked with Plymouth Boat Trips uh, for a couple of years. Um, I'll talk in a bit more detail about the, the projects we did later on. Um, and then uh, moved away from there and uh, last year set up my own business to support other organizations uh, in their move to uh, zero carbon as well um, and now work with a number of companies using both batteries and hydrogen injection or hydrogen fuel cell technology um, so really exciting uh, really interesting work I am not an engineer though uh, I have to make that clear so if you ask me any too, too many complicated engineering questions at the end I may well have to defer to somebody who, who does know that um, I'm more of an operator or a manager of the, the project and the, the system um, I'm now also working with uh, the Cornwall Marine Hydrogen um, Centre, 
uh, based in Falmouth, who uh, developing a test rig to trial the use of uh, hydrogen fuel cells on under 18 meter commercial and leisure vessels. So that's a really interesting project and also part of the UK Marine Hydrogen Working Group. So I've got a little bit of electric background from the or batteries from my work with Plymouth Boat Trips and others subsequently, and a bit of an understanding of the hydrogen world as well. So um, I'll be talking about zero carbon, really that relates to smaller commercial vessels, although inevitably it stretches beyond that because it's difficult to put a boundary on what's small and what isn't in the real world. Um, but that's the area where I've got the experience. What we'll do is look at where we've come from, um, yeah, what, what's happened to, to get us into a position where we're now looking to develop these solutions. What are the challenges we face as we've tried to move to a zero carbon solution and where the future may lay? We will have a Q&A as uh, Gordon said at the end. So if you just hold on to your questions until I've finished uh, talking to you. Um, so if we start then what's happened so far really uh, for batteries, uh, for electric batteries have been around for a long time. First battery, uh, 1799, and then batteries were put on submarines really early on. 1883, the first batteries went onto a submarine with electric motors. And um, around the beginning of the 20th century, a lot of small electric motors were used. They were dominant until the arrival of petrol outboards. So there's a lot of history really um, in the use of those. But it, was, but it wasn't really until the 70s when rechargeable lithium batteries were becoming available through Exxon initially. And then in 2006, when Tesla first started with their battery cars and progress really started to speed up. And we saw in 2012, really lithium ion batteries becoming more common on smaller vessels for propulsion. So there's a little bit of history there and it's starting to accelerate as we move forward now. With hydrogen fuel cells, um, it was a 1889 when the first gas battery was invented and called a fuel cell. And then they were developed further as well. So the first one went onto a tractor uh, in 1959 and then onto a spacecraft, the Gemini 5 spacecraft used fuel cells. And then in 2004, uh, Hyundai produced the first concept car using fuel cells, which is the Tucson. And 2018, 2014, Honda and Toyota have produced their solutions as well. So where are we with uh, commercial vessels? Let me just share my screen now. And hopefully we'll get that. I'll give it a second just to wake up. Yep, hopefully everybody can see that. Can somebody give me a thumbs up? Yeah, thank you, Paul. Right, so I've done that a little bit there. So, right, the first, or what's seen as the first electric commercial uh, battery ferry um, was the Ampere um, in Norway. Um, many of you probably already know about this vessel because it's a very well-known vessel. Um, she's a 260 foot long twin hull made of aluminium. Um, she is powered by two 450 kilowatt electric motors with batteries and carries 10 tons of lithium ion batteries uh, with about a thousand kilowatt hours of energy storage on board. So uh, she can, she operates um, with a relatively fast turnaround, but with a poor supply of uh, energy um, at each end. So what has been done with this particular vote vessel is a really uh, ingenious way of um, using the, the poor energy supply. They have large battery banks effectively at each side of the 5.7 kilometer journey across the fjord, which they trickle charge. And then when the vessel comes in, uh, in a period of about 10 minutes, they recharge the vessel back up to um, full um, charge to enable her to operate again. Um, so a really novel way of doing that. And we'll talk a little bit more detail about how that can be used as we look at how um, fully electric can be used in areas in the UK where perhaps power supply isn't what it could be, which is one of the challenges with the infrastructure. So 
The next one I wanted to talk about was the E-Voyager, which was the uh, vessel that Plymouth boat trips operated or operate. So the E-Voyager was converted by their boatyard at Voyager uh, on the opposite side of the Tamar. Um, she was launched in October 2020, despite the pandemic, and generated huge interest as the aim of this vessel was to develop a propulsion system that will work on larger commercial vessels. Although she's only about eight meters long, she, she was designed to use equipment that was likely to be usable on larger scale um, vessels. So she was powered by repurposed Nissan Leaf batteries built into four small battery modules powering a 160 kilowatt motor. All the systems were on her were designed, as I say, to be scaled up. So the motor was well in excess of that required for that vessel. We took out a 60 horsepower diesel, um, so whatever that is, 45, uh, kilowatts and put in a 160 kilowatt motor within her purely because we wanted to use a motor that would be usable on a larger scale vessel. Um, this allowed us to try the use of this technology with a big eye on where this was heading and we worked closely with a group of local organizations to develop the vessel and the solution and this was received, received with massive publicity, international publicity. I think it took us all a little bit by surprise as to the amount of interest that was generated with this vessel. I think this was partly because it was one of the first, if not the first uh, commercial passenger vessel to be able to operate um, close to the sea. There've been a few that have been operating on lakes and uh, in the, on rivers, but I think this was the first one that's been developed to be operated on uh, sea, in sea conditions. An important part of this development uh, was to work, with relation, work on relationships with both the MCA and CLASS and to move the discussions forward about how full electric propulsion could provide a solution to a range of vessels and uses. And although it's only a couple of years ago uh, when this started, there, there was very little that had been done really with uh, full electric propulsion or commercial vessels. There were, there were some uh, that, that had been trials which um, were not complete, where they were hybrid operations. Um, so this, this was quite an interesting one for, for both the MCA and CLASS to get involved in, uh, because they could see exactly where we were leading with this. So uh, Plymouth Boat Trips and Voyager Boat were the leaders with the project with significant support from the universities of Exeter and Plymouth, uh, together with a North Devon company called EV Parts, who worked on the batteries, motors, et cetera and Tainbridge Propellers, who helped us to develop a solution for the propeller. And one of the things that was really important when we were looking at how we developed this vessel was to look at all aspects of the operation. So even simple things like uh, when we're driving from that uh, motor, do we need to put a gearbox in place? Because there is no need to, because going ahead in the stern, just you turn the motor the other way around, you know, it just spins the opposite direction. You don't need a gearbox to do that. Um, so we would only need a gearbox to maintain efficiency of the, uh, the system so that we were staying in the highest level of efficiency of drive, um, which typically for the electric motors is somewhere in the high 2000s, low 3000 RPM. But when we looked at it, um, if we were to put a gearbox in it, you lose quite a lot of efficiency just by putting a gearbox in place. And so we worked out that if we could keep the maximum revs at up to around 1600 RPM, we were still in an efficiency range that made it viable for us to do this without the use of a gearbox. So we got Tainbridge to propellers to uh, develop a fairly small propeller for this vessel, but one that was capable of spinning it up to around 1600 RPM, where, you know, and still hold, having grip and still performing at low revs as well. Um, and that way we, we managed to complete the conversion without the use of a gearbox. And that was something we were looking to do as we move forward with, with large vessels. Uh, unfortunately, the pandemic sort of took hold of, of business and uh, the, the uh, funding sort of slowly dried up a little bit. So the, the other projects which we were involved in was the design for the conversion of a larger passenger vessel and also the, a new build designed for the Kremel Ferry. Uh, those elements were both completed as well, so they're, they're ready to go, uh, but really waiting for uh, the opportunity to do that. So other interesting vessels that are out and about. So um, hydrogen use really on commercial vessels is a little way behind batteries. The vessels are just starting to emerge with this. Um, 
this one here in the States um, is their first hydrogen fuel cell vessel just being launched. That's a 70 foot sea change is a 75 passenger electric powered hydrogen fuel cell vessel that will carry passengers on San Francisco Bay. And there are others as well. The same people who built the Ampere um, are just in the final stages, I think, of their uh, a new vessel, which will be hydrogen fuel cells operating in one of their fields as well. And then um, we also have uh, a larger vessel here. So that's why I say the overlap between large and small disappears at times. Um, it says very clearly there what it is. It's the world's first liquid hydrogen fuel cell cruise ship plan for Norwegian fjords. Um, massive scale compared to the things I've been talking about. Uh, but there's rapid development taking all over the place. Norway, uh, Scandinavia in general, as I think probably most people would know, are, are taking quite a lead in this um, because the, you know, the funding opportunities there are, are significantly greater. However, we do have things happening in the UK still. So this, the vessel here has designed, been designed to operate on the Orkney Ferries route between Kirkwall and Chaffinsay, uh, where hydrogen fuel is generated through wind power. However, the ferry solution may well work on other Scottish routes um, if and when hydrogen, hydrogen becomes more available as a fuel source. So this is still very much in the design stage. Um, the Orkney Islands have been working uh, really hard on, on systems to use the hydrogen. They, they have excess wind power up there, which they've been using to create hydrogen or using to convert um, water into um, hydrogen. And then they've been using it alongside, they've been using it for all sorts of different things on, on another vessel and also in road transport. So they've, they've been using their hydrogen. And this is the first step to a bigger, uh, a bigger change there. There are other things happening as well. So um, this is the Viking Energy, uh, which will be an ammonium-based fuel cell, operating with ammonium-based fuel cell. And according to the project plans, um, that will meet 60 or 70% of the power requirements on board for a test period of a year. Um, they'll be able to use LNG as a fuel, and the remaining power requirement will be met by battery um, through using the hydrogen fuel cell. So there's a lot going on there. Um, there are many other projects underway, quite a number underway in the UK as well at the moment. Um, so I think we'll see a rapidly developing, uh, rapidly developing technology around all of this. And there are many challenges that we face as, as part of that. And it's how we get uh, beyond those challenges that's really, um, or past some of those challenges, that's re really important. Uh, and we'll spend a little bit of time looking at those. So the, sorry, I've come too far forward there. I do apologize. I'll just go back one. There we are. Um, so the, the challenges we find really are finding a suitable power source with adequate uh, or appropriate fuel density. Diesel is really. Today, not beautiful. What's happening? Hello. Somebody unmuting. No. So finding a suitable power source is. Uh, really important because diesel is really energy dense uh, and batteries and hydrogen are lesser. We'll have a look at specifically what they do offer. Uh, but finding um, either a more energy dense solution or looking at how we can make the best use of the energy that we have available is, is really important. Also, one of the really big challenges is supporting infrastructure. So it's fantastic having all of these new technologies where we need um, electricity to charge our batteries, or we may need uh, hydrogen bunkering or uh, ammonia bunkering, you know, supply. Um, how do we get that in place? And particularly if we're looking at those smaller commercial vessels, which tend to operate in relatively small ports, often quite close to big areas of the population, there's some significant challenges about how we do that. Uh, even with electricity, getting sufficient supply in place may well be a massive challenge in some locations. Um, so there's, there's a lot of conversations and a lot of discussions to be had around how that's resolved. Um, I'll talk a little bit when we get to that supporting infrastructure about what happened with our vessel and how we were planning to move forward there um, and, and what Plymouth City Council have put in place. The next one I want to look at is economic viability. Um, because all of the 
um, but all of the um, work that I've shown you so far, all of the vessels that I've shown you so far, are really expensive vessels because the technology is very new. And they've all happened as a result of support through uh, government or uh, funding from a source, an external source of some, some sort or other. And that, that'll work for a little while. Uh, and that perhaps will work during this very innovative early stage. But at some point that needs to change. And, and we'll look at, look at that and the pressures that, that that may raise. And then the other element I wanted to talk about was regulatory approvals and the challenges that we get there. So we all want to operate uh, safe uh, vessels. We don't, we don't want them to be dangerous in any way whatsoever. But we also want to be able to um, innovate, put new ideas into practice. And what we can't um, have is something that stifles that innovation, stifles that development. There has to be some sort of approach that allows us both to um, develop new ideas and test them and actually, where possible, put them into practice very quickly. And typically, regulations have taken an awfully long time to actually get in place. Uh, and we'll have a brief discussion around how that can work. So looking in a second at the, um, yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that in a second, right. So the first one I talked about was um, the energy density um, and the, the different types really of uh, systems. So we've got here three tables which contain some information about battery, lithium ion batteries on the left. In the center is the, proton exchange membrane, the PEM, FCE fuel cells, and then internal combustion engines, diesels or whatever. So if we're looking at those, there are three things I want to just pick out as comparison, which will perhaps be quite meaningful as we, as we talk about it. So on the lithium ion battery, the top one there is device efficiency. And what we're talking about there is the drive to the shaft, and the same pretty much with all of these, it's the point up to the shaft. Um, so there, um, the figures that were given are that it's very efficient. Uh, it's 92% um, of the energy gets transferred, basically. With fuel cells, it's less efficient because there are more supporting services required for that. So we're looking at 50 to 60%. And with uh, internal combustion, we'll all be aware it's around 30 to 40% in some um, vessels and vehicles. They're claiming slightly more than that now. Uh, but it's that sort of figure. So you can see there's a really dramatic difference in the uh, efficiencies of the, de the devices. And if you remember back when I was talking about the e Voyager, and I was saying we were trying to avoid having a gearbox because of the inefficiencies that puts in place, we were trying to keep that device efficiency as high as we could do by having as simple a system as we could in place. So partly from an efficiency point of view, uh, which is really important, but the fewer components you have, the less maintenance you have to complete as well. Um, so it works as a bonus all, all around. So one of the things we managed to do was to look at the power curves for the uh, motor. And there's actually an area where the efficiency dropped a little bit, uh, but not too much. So we were still getting in the, in the low 90s straight off the, the motor by operating at 1600 RPM. And to get anywhere near sort of the, the high 90s, we, we'd have been operating at a rare range that was of no value to us, to be honest. It, it wasn't going to help what we were looking to do. And if we look at the next one would be the energy density, the third one down in each of them, um, where we're looking at uh, the gravimetric, the weight of the, um, the battery or fuel or fuel cell. So we're looking at um, in batteries, it's 150 watt hours of energy uh, per kilogram. So if we look across there to fuel cells, massive increase. So three, nearly four times, so 550 watt hours per kilogram. And then if we move to the um, diesel or fuel, uh, we're looking at about a thousand watt hours per kilogram. So you know, a huge multiplier greater than the best of batteries in particular. So you're looking at whatever that is, six, seven times uh, greater than you would get with batteries. And that's one of the really big challenges. Uh, for this, as, a, as I mentioned at the beginning, is to try and find a solution where it is appropriate for the, the use that our vessel needs. So looking back at how we use the vessels in, in the boat trips, 
we tended to put several thousand litres into those boats, or smaller ones, maybe a few hundred litres, which would be enough for a week or maybe longer. And then we'd steam around with it because the fuel was quite light and it was nice and sorry, quite cheap and quite easy for us to steam around with, it didn't really make any difference. Um, what we'd have to look at with batteries is changing that. So rather than fueling every week or thereabouts, we'd fuel every, every night um, to get the amount of energy we needed. And that would have provided us with sufficient power to operate those larger vessels that we had, provided we had enough shore power in place to do that. And that's the, there's a whole lot of different areas that we have to look at to actually make sure that we've got that, that balance right. And the other thing is to look at when, when you're thinking about the energy density and the number of batteries that you may require is, is not to compare like with like. So if you're looking at using a, a converting or building a vessel which has um, something other than diesel as its propulsion, you know, as its power, uh, an internal combustion engine, what is really worth doing is, is looking at what you really need to do to operate. Um, an example of that would be that um, on the uh, Kremel ferry run, one of the focuses was that we needed that engine to be running initially. One of the focuses was that we needed the engine to be running for 14 hours a day, because when it tied up alongside, they used the engine to hold the vessel alongside. It had two lines out as well, they had a spring and a headline, but they used the, sp the spring really and the, the engine to keep it in place. Part of that was uh, because you do get some sea there and it, it holds it nicely with the movement, but also the de design of the vessels was such that they, they were older style vessels. Um, so they have a fairly narrow bow, which is where people boarded from. So you need to pinch the bow in. Uh, there's a whole load of design in amongst that. Um, what, what we sort of worked out was we probably didn't need to be anywhere near that because if you bring a, an electric um, vessel to um, stop, it, produce, it uses zero power, whereas the, um, a diesel still will be idling along and using a little bit of power. Um, the electric one uses zero. So as long as you can actually secure that boat safely, you can actually relook at that working pattern, that duty cycle of that vessel, and actually start to understand where you can make changes. And the other element is that speed makes such a massive difference. So going from five to six knots or seven to eight knots adds a huge percentage difference in terms of power that you actually use. So it's really worth looking at what you're really trying to achieve going back to the start really and, and look at what your aims were with that vessel, not looking at how you achieved them with your previous vessel or the previous engine, look at what you're actually trying to achieve and then review that. How can I achieve it with this power? And it may be that you can't, and it may be that another solution is the right one because you know, it's got to be right for that, for that particular use. And I think that's one of the really important things to, to understand, understand why that duty cycle assessment should include more than just measuring what you're currently doing, but to look at our whole view of the operational cycle. And then the other one I wanted to look at here is the second from the bottom, which is the lifetime CO2 emissions. Um, because one of the things that's um, often said nowadays is that uh, batteries and fuel cells, hydrogen fuel cells, use exactly the same or produce exactly the same CO2 as diesel does because all of the electricity and all of the hydrogen is produced through non-environmentally uh, friendly methods, you know, by, by um, running coal-fired coal -fired power stations, diesel, you know, gas power stations, whatever else it is. Um, and if you look at the figures in this lifetime CO2 emissions, if they're clear enough, for the batteries, it says uh, it's 0.15 to 0.25. Um, and in the, fuel cells 0.13 to 0.22 and in um, internal combustion engine it's 0.25. So if you look at the, you know, the, the right hand figures for all of those that's for the worst case um, example for the uh, fuel cells and the batteries that's with the, all the fuel being produced so all the energy being produced through uh, the, the current setup effectively of uh, power stations without the use of any green energy. The left hand figure for those of 0.15 and 0.13 would equate to if we're using wind or solar. Um, that's, that's where those figures start to come in. And also the, the lifetime 
uh, value of those batteries on a, on a slight tangent can be improved because they, although the batteries after 10 plus years may not be usable for propulsion, they could be used for energy storage in a different capacity, in a different way. So again, we have to look at how, how we use these. So we, we're not throwing them away at 10 years, we're, we're looking to reuse them, repurpose them in a different way. So if we look at hydrogen, I've got some figures here, uh, which may be interesting. So hydrogen is classified in three different um, ways. There's gray hydrogen, uh, which is produced by steam methane reforming and coal gasification. So very high carbon emissions, but very cheap to do. There's then a blue hydrogen, which is a very small percentage, which um, is gray hydrogen, but carbon is captured and stored. So uh, all of the carbon, or as much carbon as possible is taken out practically in the exhaust stage. Um, so you get low carbon emissions, but it's extremely expensive to produce. And then green hydrogen is produced by electrolysis of water powered by renewable energy. The zero, yeah, through zero carbon emissions, currently very expensive. Green hydrogen currently makes up about 4% of the world's hydrogen. So we've got lots of vessels that are converting, not lots, we have a number of vessels that are now looking at using hydrogen, but trying to source green hydrogen is, is a real challenge at the moment. That will change as time goes on, and the number of uh, wind farms, for example, around the UK grows dramatically, and in other parts of the world, then more green hydrogen could be produced from that. So particularly at times when there's excess production of energy, um, so it could be during the night or it could be during the winter periods, we can produce excess, you know, greater quantities of hydrogen, which can be stored and then used for other sectors like shipping. Okay, so what we'll do now is move on to supporting infrastructure. How much for time? Okay. Um, so supporting infrastructure is another challenge. There's, there's lots of challenges with this, as you probably see as we go along. So. Thinking about um, electricity primarily to start with, supplying sufficient charging capacity for larger vessels will require longer term investment. It's going to be a massive change for all coastal environments, particularly ports such as Plymouth. Um, it'll have a significant impact on that. And particularly ports, again, like Plymouth, where there are large sections which are places like the Barbican, for example, which are historic areas trying to put in a uh, large scale charging infrastructure there or on the commercial keys um, is it, gonna be you know, a, a real difficulty. And the other thing we have to look at is what happens to all of those small commercial vessels that are on moorings? Where do they come in to get their charging, uh, their charging done? And how can we do that? So there's lots of challenges around doing that. Anyone with an electric car will know about the challenges sometimes finding a charging point as well. And there are now 30,000 charge points in the UK. However, there are only 13 for hydrogen. So you can see how far behind hydrogen is with, the, with that. And it, it's probably in a similar place, maybe a little bit closer to electric in, in shipping or commercial vessels. I think we do have some challenges here. Um, Plymouth um, is set to become the first city in the UK. You can see the, the image here relates to this. Uh, Plymouth is set to become the first city in the UK to install a network of shoreside charging facilities for, for, its, for its expanding fleet of electric maritime vessels. Over the past year or so, the city has become home to the UK's first marine electric passenger ferry, the E Voyager, and an electric water taxi uh, that will operate 364 days a year. However, access to infrastructure is currently a barrier to ensuring further growth in this emerging sector. And it needs to be done in a coordinated and sustainable way. With that in mind, a consortium of the city partners is joining forces to create a Plymouth Marine Charging, e-charging living lab, MEL, which will provide the pivotal infrastructure required to accelerate innovation and growth. So the, this is a fantastic um, scheme to enable uh, primarily small boat operators to, to charge their vessels. Um, and we will see, I think, examples of that cropping up around 
uh, the UK as we, as we move forward. The, we will have um, challenges all over. Although we, I think with some imagination, uh, planning and support, we can use the range of alternatives that are available to enable work, work to uh, continue. So things like the Ampere that I was talking about earlier on, the Norwegian vessel, has shoreside battery banks which trickle charge which can trickle charge from the local supply, which is quite poor because it comes from a hydroelectric scheme in that particular case. But in the UK, it could be that uh, we could use battery banks that charge up during off peak periods and then supply the vessel with rapid DC charging when required. And if we can do that, what that then enables is those vessels that are maybe on moorings could come in and rapidly charge their uh, battery banks. Because if we do DC, DC charging with the right charging infrastructure in place, we can actually charge relatively quickly. The example given was that Ampere, which is charging in somewhere like 10 or 15 minutes with massive um, battery banks on there. What we can also do with that, if we're really um, sensible about how these are set up, is we can use the, the vessel storage and also the battery storage that's held on the keys, wherever that may be, to feed local communities when it's not required by the vessels, smoothing out peak demands. So we could have a quite beneficial um, arrangement that works both for the, for the cities or the towns and also for the maritime users, where you know, if, we, if we use um, the passenger vessel operation as an example, um, they're looking for their, vessel, their batteries to be charged so they can operate between sort of nine and typically sort of seven or eight occasions later in the evening, but normally that sort of period. But overnight, they, they don't really need um, much. So if, if we were to arrange for those vessels to get uh, charged up relatively quickly, they can then act as a backup for the, the town during that evening period, potentially, particularly during the winter when more power is required and fewer of their vessels are operating. We can use that battery bank and the growing size of those battery banks to help take the, the peak demands off the uh, network and make full use of those. And then we get feed in tariffs as well, which helps make it beneficially beneficial financially. So there's a lot of work going on in, in, in how this, this can be made to work. And particularly in areas where getting um, significant supplies to smaller communities may be a challenge. One of the other challenges around um, the conversion to uh, battery, battery particularly, is cost. So battery costs, um, as shown here, this was uh, from a report from Southampton University recently, uh, based on uh, a Scandinavian ferry. Uh, um, so what we can see here is back in 2015, uh, the cost in euros per kilowatt hour was just over a thousand. Uh, we we're in the region of 400 or so um, at the moment, 400, 450, I think it is somewhere around that kilowatt euros per kilowatt hour. Uh, the forecast is that's going to drop dramatically. Um, so even with the rising cost of lithium, um, because of the greater numbers of users in this field, uh, the forecast is that by 2035, it will be somewhere in the region of uh, 100 euros per kilowatt hour. Obviously, that's a forecast. Um, it doesn't mean it's going to happen. Uh, but the trend has been for the price to come down uh, over the last few years and quite dramatically in the early years of it, this happening. Um, and as more manufacturers start to work in the uh, uh, marine battery module manufacture, then actually that has an Im impact on price as well. And there's, you know, there's talk of things happening in the UK to support that as well, which would be fantastic. There are also other elements of equipment uh, which will fall or predict to fall as, as demand and therefore associated with supply increases. When we were doing the Little Vestal, the uh, eVoyager, we looked outside of the marine world of what we were going to do and, lo and looked at, as you would have done with a, a diesel engine for those sizes of vessels, HGV and bus or tractor market were the places where those original diesel engines came from and then they were marinized. So we did the same with the electric motor um, and used one that came from uh, HGV, small HGV, um, because we were looking for something that would be suitably robust uh, and we were delighted with what we got there. I think what we're saying really with this is initially uh, further grant support will be required because we're still in that early stage of development. 
But longer term, this can't be viable as an option. It has to be self-sustaining. And therefore, we, we have to sort of somewhere along this line, there has to be a transition from where we're, we're reliant on funding from uh, grant support or um, government in some way or other to one which is, is more self-sustaining. And there's been a lot of work um, done with this from an institute based in um, Denmark, the Merce McKinney uh, Centre for Zero Carbon Shipping. Um, and one of the things they're, they're talking about is uh, finance sector mobilisation. So talking really there about banks and other capital providers who are already deeply engaged in reducing their carbon footprint, but on a global scale, the effects have not yet been seen on shipping. And they believe that over time, zero carbon vessels can be financed with lower cost of capital than fossil vessels. The spread can increase to more than 2% towards the end of this decade. And both banks and equity investors, equity investors will relocate their portfolios. So I think from our point of view, as people, as me, as somebody who's working with companies who are looking organizations looking to operate um, zero carbon vessels and for operators who may be doing it directly it's to start to engage with some of those organizations and, and look at whether there are ways that we can get finance which are appropriate for our, for our particular businesses so rather than necessarily always going for grants look at other ways of financing it and start to push the market a little bit or pull the market in the right direction as we maybe we see it um, Sorry, we'll go back again. I'm jumping forward too quickly. Um, just a few of the other points that um, the report that um, the uh, Merck Muller Centre for Zero Carbon Shipping made, uh, because there's some, some really interesting um, points that they, they talked about here. Um, so they were looking at energy and fuel advancements on shore, technical and technological advancements on ships, customer demand and pull. I've talked already about the finance centre mobilisation and policy and regulation. So I'll just briefly touch on the points they've made because I think they quite nicely uh, summarise where, where perhaps we are and where we may need to go. So energy and fuel advancements on shore is required to scale up production and over time push down the cost curves for alternative fuels. Technical readiness levels for production of alternative fuels are already relatively high, but commercial readiness is low. And today, mainly First generation biofuels are commonly, oh, sorry, are commercially available as marine fuels and only on limited scale. So, what I think we're saying there is, or they're saying there is that, you know, there are opportunities to, to actually move to these, uh, to move to different types of fuel. But at the moment, uh, vessels, commercial operators are not really making that jump. And then the next one is advancements in ship technologies. These are under constant development with relatively high technical readiness, readiness levels. Propulsion technolo technologies for biofuel, methane, and methanol are already in commercial operation. We talked already about ammonia systems, that vessel. Fuel, system, fuel systems for fossil and alternative fuels are currently being ordered, albeit at a very low proportion of total new build orders. Future fuel prepared ship designs are under development. Several existing energy efficiency technologies are being integrated into vessels, new buildings, adoptions of newer efficiency technologies um, are gaining traction, but the overall potential for higher efficiency in the global fleet remains large. So again, there's still lots to do. And it's how we incentivize people to do that, I guess, is the, is the challenge. And almost inevitably it falls down to finance, I would think. Um, so it's how, how we move that way. So the next one was about customer demand and pull. So customer willingness to pay for zero carbon shipping services is emerging particularly in the container set segment. I think I'd add, add to that one, which they haven't put in here from my, my own um, contacts recently, is that I think in the, in the high value uh, passenger vessel, small passenger vessel market, there is also now beginning to be a pull where you may have customers who are uh, wanting to ensure that whatever they are doing is, uh, is uh, friendly, uh, ecologically friendly, uh, it doesn't create too much of a footprint, carbon footprint for them. And they, not that it can be seen to be doing the right thing, but are doing the right thing. And I think there's, there's definitely starting to be a pull from some of those vessels as well. And they're, they're sort of more in the size of the market that I'm talking about, the sort of small commercial vessels. Um, 
So, uh, and then the next one that the, uh, we talked about was the uh, financial sector mobilization. We've already done that one. And then policy and regulation. So they're saying really that the major critical lever with the highest potential is policy and regulation. Policy and regulation can not only level the global playing field, but also entirely close the cost gap between fossil and alternative fuels. The IMO has implemented short-term measures in the form of energy efficient regulation, and will soon initiate discussion of market-based measures such as carbon pricing. The European Union has launched its ambitious Fit for 55 plan. Several countries have called for decarbonisation goals. Uh, global shipping by 2050, including the US and the UK. So the, there are things that are um, starting to happen. But there's a lot more there. And I think that uh, policy um, and regulation one is a really important one. It's what I'm going to come on to now. Um, those in the UK who've uh, been in this uh, area or interested in this area will be aware of these two documents. I think both were published in 2019. So Maritime 2050, Navigating the Future and the Clean Maritime Plan. A second, I've just lost my page a second. Uh, there we are. Um, both those were uh, introduced in uh, 2019. Uh, the, 20, the Maritime 2050 sets out a series of strategic ambitions around which government and the sector will focus its efforts and core values, which we will be guided by. And the Clean Maritime Plan was sort of the environmental route map, setting out more detail how the government sees the UK's transition to future zero emissions. Um, so we've we've seen as a result, particularly I think if you look at the Clean Maritime Plan, there are particular targets uh, that have been set there, um, so that by 2025, for example, um, there is a desire to see zero carbon vessels operating within UK waters. Um, there's no stipulated numbers, it's not a requirement, it's a, an ambition. Uh, and then we move on to other ones they put in place for 2035 to 2050, which has to do with vessels being ready for conversion and vessels being able to or operating on uh, zero carbon fuels. One of the things that has happened within the Department of Transport, uh, Maritime and Coast Guard Agency, is that they've set up a, a new team, uh, which is the Maritime Future Technologies team whose aim it is to support the information, implementation and innovation of technologies in both emission reduction and autonomy. Autonomy is in there. I'm going to ignore that completely because I, I know very little about autonomy at this stage or certainly not enough to talk to anybody about. With the Future Technologies team, there's been a, a huge investment within the MCA. So in 2019, when we contacted the then single member of the team, uh, Ashley Stair, who is still the director there and responsible for that, he came along to Plymouth to meet us and to talk about what we were, or to listen to what we were trying to do and remained really interested throughout the project and still is interested on a personal level in what's happening with, with the projects that are happening around the UK. But since 2019, uh, they've now employed 50 people to work in that department. Um, the aim of that is really to, to try and support um, organizations that are moving to, um, zero carbon solutions so what they what they've said really on their on their own website is the team is to facilitate the conversion for regulatory change by understanding supporting and developing the use of these technologies for the maritime industry they are meant to be a highly collaborative dynamic fast-paced team with different skills to those traditionally mca to respond to the challenges faced so the implementation of projects in the short term on a case-by-case -case basis, they aim to facilitate that, acting as a focal point and connect, connecting the various stakeholders, both internal and external. So that would mean, for example, talking to uh, a, a company who's wanting to operate or an organization wanting to operate a zero carbon vessel through the future technologies team with the local surveying team from the MCA. So they're making sure there's a joined up picture. And recently, uh, launched a or issued a workflow um, chart showing how it's how it's meant to work. I think that's a very early version that's going to evolve as we move forward. Um, I think in contacting the um, future technologies team at an early stage and engaging with them is worth doing because um, they are interested in actually how they how they move forward with um, 
all of the new systems that are likely to be coming in and because they're all evolving quickly um, they need to look at how they uh, approach regulation and what they've said really is regulated to be changed including learning from individual projects within the current regulatory train framework that's what they're supporting and challenge that approach to um, maritime regulation and they want to drive change in the direction of industry through engagement and influencing and through sharing rather than regulating so still very early days with that and if that happens that would be a uh, fantastic uh, development for um, all of us working in this sector um, I think the engagement with them um, at times can be a challenge um, because find, now that there are 50 of them, finding the ones that are appropriate um, sometimes proves more difficult than when you can pick up the phone and speak to Ash it's there and say, what, what do we do here? Um, but I think you know, that their desire is to actually try and support us. And clearly through what's happening with Maritime 2050 and the Clean Maritime Plan, they have a directive to, to make that happen. It, it's very unlikely with this rapidly changing um, landscape that we have that they will be able to keep regulations up to a point where they are compatible with innovation so um, they, they have taught previously about a risk-based approach which is that which um, the uh, classification society they'll listed three down the bottom right who've got sets of rules in place for all of the um, or most of the new technologies so if you're looking at uh, use of hydrogen fuel cells or hydrogen or batteries and they have sets of rules some of which have been established for quite a number of years now and they're familiar with working it with those it's that relationship and where they, they tie in with how the mca works uh, that, that's really important uh, particularly for those smaller commercial vessels uh, and particularly when we're looking at using uh, different bodies maybe not always class um, to, to actually uh, get them approved so there's still lots of work to do and lots of development, but I think at least they've now got a team together and hopefully a plan to make that work. So I think the, the next thing is to look at uh, where we go from here. Um, sort of getting about five minutes or so from, from the end of uh, my talk now. So where do we go from here? Well, that there are massive opportunities and challenges uh, for all of us involved. It is likely that in the short term, there will be early adopters of technology. Um, this is especially suited to the small vessel sector, although other so sectors have shown significant interest, as was mentioned there in that earlier report, where the fast container vessels have shown interest, and in particular sectors where funding is uh, more generous, perhaps in the Scandinavian areas. The technologies of batteries, hydrogen, ammonia, methanol, and maybe even small nuclear reactors are starting to be talked about may provide us with a mix of potential long-term solutions for the small inshore vessel. The first time most likely is to work for those with either high power requirements or longer characteristics, then one of the other solutions or something entirely new will be required. What is clear is that incentives, financial support and market forces will be the drivers to make this happen. It has to be commercially viable to work and it is only with high level support that we can move forward at a fast rate fast enough rate to take to control the impact of burning fossil fuels. But, sorry, start again. It has to be commercially viable to work and it is only with high level support that we can move forward at a fast enough rate to control the impact of burning fossil fuels and the effect it is having on our health and climate. And just to end with, there's a picture of my dad. Um, stood on board HMS Taciturn, a diesel electric submarine in the 1950s. He was a PO electrician on this diesel electric, which could operate for many hours on battery alone. To be honest, I could never imagine that I would be supporting, be a supporting organizations wanting to operate batteries so many years later. Thank you. And that's me completed my presentation. Uh, any questions? Well, thank you very much, uh, Andy. Absolutely fascinating uh, to go through the, really the history of where we started and uh, where we came from as to what we're trying to achieve now. And I see it at the end of the day that we're talking about the future today, um, which for me is quite enthralling. 
Um, I work in the renewables uh, and energy business and uh, colleagues here on the Merce vessel I'm on have already been discussing only this week about uh, offshore electric charging facilities. That's more a moored system for near offshore uh, vessels, which is fascinating. Um, a lot of the substations going into the uh, UK uh, renewables energy sector uh, are already talking uh, about the possibility of converting some of those to hydrogen uh, production. So, yeah, uh, as far as the maritime goes, it, it, it looks like a, it's not exactly leaps and bounds, but we're all going in the right direction. And I think about 30 years ago, uh, when I was uh, a bit younger, that the only electrical vehicles were the comedy ones like uh, golf buggies and uh, milk floats. And of course, uh, BMW and a great many uh, uh, other car manufacturers have, have launched from hybrids now to EVs in total. And, and those charging stations, you know, when we're talking about the UK, uh, are, are becoming more prolific. So, uh, yeah, fascinating to know how the Maritimes are uh, keeping up with that. If I can see a hand raised or anyone has a, a question, uh, please do. You haven't all got video on, but if you wish to raise a hand electronically on the little symbol. Yeah, Richard, uh, unmute yourself, please. Go ahead. Gordon. I think I'm unmuted now. First of all, apologies for, I think everyone heard me asking my wife how she was. She fell off her horse today. So that was me getting in and checking how she was. So sorry for earlier. Um, Andy, thanks for that. Very, very interesting. Uh, I'm glad Dan turned up as well. That was very good of the Pinner City Council to attend. Two, two questions really, Andy. Is this an answer or is electric the stepping stone until we get to the answer? And also, when I went to a talk recently, the head of the MTA stated what excites them the most is nuclear, nuclear fusion. And I didn't know what that was. And I just saw breaking news on the on BBC News today. They've had a, yeah. a big breakthrough on nuclear fusion. So it, it, just 30 seconds on what that actually is. I think it uses hydrogen, but I don't I don't know. So it just caught my eye. Thank you, Richard. I'll, I'll answer the easy one first. Okay. <laughs> is, um, <laughs> is electric just a stepping stone? Um, I think with, with, with all of the um, new technologies, it's probably not going to be one answer fits all. Um, it's going to vary depending on what your usage, usage is. And I, I, I probably laboured the point a little bit when I was talking about the sort of duty cycles and how you use your vessel. And it, it's really important for whoever you choose to um, come and look at what the correct solution for you is isn't just selling the solution they happen to be selling because yeah. there are going to be an increasing number of options for some vessels and pbt the vessels which have fairly short low energy duty cycles electric may well be the permanent solution for them to be honest um, because they don't use a lot of energy uh, and it'll work you know it should work quite nicely for them um, there are huge advantages to doing it above the the fact that you're clean energy, that the nature of the vessel will change as a result of it. So if you have two big dirty diesels in your vessel, in your vessel and you're carrying 4,000 litres of fuel or whatever it is around all day, your vessels tend to be a little bit grubbier than they would be if you're running on um, electric, which are completely clean. Maintenance yeah. is very, very low. And the approach of the people working on the boats changes completely. We noticed that even with the Voyager, a like change in attitude straight away because actually people were, it was very easy to keep it looking fantastic. Uh, and therefore yeah. they did. And there's a huge sense yeah. of pride that goes with it as well. Um, so I, th I think for some vessels, electric will always be the answer. There'll be other ones where you have a higher power demand, but not necessarily for a prolonged period. So that could be some fishing vessels, for example, may do that, or maybe harbour tugs. Um, yeah where hydrogen may, may provide the right solution because you could store enough hydrogen on board um, to actually make that viable. Um, and for other ones, it might be that ammonia uh, gives you that longer range. Nuclear fuels, I know nothing about at all, to be honest, Richard. I can't answer that neither question do I. for you. It, neither do I. Um, the, the, the only it, interesting it, one it, I saw the other day was, and I, I, I haven't had time to Google it to actually verify this again, but so it may be faded in my memory, was that the hottest place in the universe the other day was just outside of Southampton um, because they were doing um, some um, vision uh, there. And 
uh, I think they generate, I can't remember the number of tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of degrees it was. It was from a fraction of a second. Wow. But it, but the, so it, it's definitely progressing. And you're absolutely right. It was mentioned at the um, London Shipping Week um, by, by the, the MCA that that was seen as a potential solution. Uh, and I think those smaller reactors may well be the way forward. But it's, it's not an area I can contribute to in any way whatsoever. Sorry. Uh, that's fun. I, I just saw a breaking news today on, on, on that exact thing. Yeah. And I just, just yeah, it flashed up it. on my Thank phone you. earlier, but I didn't have time to have a look, unfortunately. I, yeah. um, right. I, yeah, I, I, I saw it likewise, and having served on submarines, I'm only used to the uh, what was the form of the pressurized water reactor uh, as a propulsion system, which is steam with steam steam turbines. Although we also had batteries as well, could run diesel electric. But yeah, I've yet to read that news, but I saw it flash up this morning and thought, oh, this is very topical for Andy. But by then, I had to set up uh, for this meeting. But I think that the whole emphasis yeah. behind that is the smaller units, and I think it's. Uh, it's going to take some time for people to get their head around the fact that although you have nuclear aircraft carriers, submarines and icebreakers, you know, the future is that uh, with those small fission units like that, hospitals could be powered by them and uh, smaller commercial vessels. So uh, yeah. the future is going in all directions. But of course, mariners need yeah, to be I trained think... in this and the maritime is always slow with, with the uptake with this. So the, the future mariner, yeah. uh, of course, which is I'm going to put a small uh, advert in part of the Nautical Institute's uh, 50th uh, celebrations and, and AGM. Uh, and thank you for all those uh, branches uh, internationally that are supporting that as well. It's going to be very much on that topic, uh, uh, not, not only these technologies, but the, the training, uh, the future leaders and the, and the future mariners that are going to be running these machines. Sorry for the blatant yeah. advert there. <laughs> you, you shouldn't be sorry. <laughs> it's good to do it, actually. <laughs> Yeah. Um, just to pick up on a couple that... of points that were made there. Um, so uh, Richard asked about um, the stepping stones, and you know, I mentioned earlier on about hydrogen. And one of the, the challenges with hydrogen is the storage of sufficient hydrogen. Um, so it's storing it under you know, very high pressure, so 300 or 700 bar, or um, very chilled in liquid form, minus 250 degrees centigrade. So there are huge challenges about doing that. And also, it, it, it's how to store that safely uh, on a small vessel. Um, so, you know, where can you put it if you're if you're looking to put it on a passenger vessel? Where where do you store sufficient uh, hydrogen to operate for, for twelve hours? And then, where do you get your bunkering facilities in a, a city to replenish that? Um, so, that, you know, there's, there's huge challenges about whichever option you, you choose um, has challenges at this stage because they're all so new. And in the um, offshore uh, pick... wind, wind energy, they've, there's already discussions, and I've seen some prototypes being discussed about uh, offshore yeah. subsea storage. Um, yeah, yeah. So that, that's fascinating as well. Yeah, yeah. the training side we're, we're working on as well. So um, currently in another project where we're working with the MCA, again, the Future Technologies team, to look at what... So we put together a training matrix, so what is required to operate, and so we've now sending that to the MCA and talking to the MCA about how do we get that sort of form of training approved. So we're trying to do that at a really early stage. So actually we can get stuff in place and maybe even uh, apprenticeships in place for the engineers and electricians um, to actually work on the new systems that are required. Um, so, so, so that we've, we've got that in place because trying to get people to maintain these new vessels is also going to be a challenge because mm -hmm. there isn't that... Um, structure in place to do it at the moment. And who would have thought this may be the rebirth of ETOs and Sparkies back at sea, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Can I, can I ask a question? Um, you mentioned, in fact, Plymouth being sort of at the forefront. Uh, we have what, three major marinas here within the, in this, within the port. Um, a lot of those boats actually have used, used their diesel engines for a very limited time indeed. Um, can you, would you envisage that, in fact, the owners of those yachts uh, and their boats will actually have to change their units, um, possibly for the end of their, 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 their vessel's life? Um, I mean, it's uh, an unusual normally that the vessel will go on until it dies uh, and then it's sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, is refurbished. But, uh, yeah, just a comment, really, about how you see for the, the um, yacht owner. 
uh, and uh, uh, how he would pro progress. Yeah, it mirrors. Yeah, thank you, Paul. It mirrors a little bit the commercial world in that there are um, builder, boat builders already who are offering um, completely zero carbon solutions. So they're fitting electric uh, motors and batteries into the vessels at the time of manufacture of them. Not many, and not many of their range, uh, but that is starting to happen. We've seen um, for quite a number of years the availability of electric outboards. Um, you know, there's been a, a stack of those, and they've improved to a point where they're now probably more viable than they were in their early days. The power output and the sizes is, is appropriate. So I think we'll see those, those starting to, to come in. I don't think, personally, I don't think the, the country is in a, in a position to legislate to make it compulsory because it, it can't support that. Yeah, the, the, there is no infrastructure in place. Um, there would be no will, I don't think, within uh, the voting community to make that happen at this stage. But my, my own guess, and that's all it is, is that over the uh, next few years, we'll start to see changes in taxation that make diesel more expensive. But before that happens, there has to be enough infrastructure and support in place to, to get people to actually move. And that both that applies equally to commercial as it does to uh, leisure. And you know, that's yes, what I was sir. talking about in terms, in terms of finance, yeah, yeah. really. Yeah, that's interesting. Of course, a little while ago, a couple of years ago, we had a, a little challenge uh, to refurbish a, a vessel and to replace the main engine. Uh, and we did debate, should we go in fact for electric or should we actually go to diesel? Uh, and as it was a sort of traditional vessel, uh, we actually replaced diesel with diesel. Uh, and one of the reasons for that was, in fact, the, um, the, the concern that we would have a, a safety issue. Uh, because uh, mm -hmm. if you're carrying your own sort of diesel with you, you're not going to, you, you, it's a much more secure situation than actually having a battery and having to top up the shore. That was, uh, and so we went ahead and uh, a, a new diesel engine was purchased and it was installed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we'll, we'll see changes in technology that uh, make it more feasible to yeah. reuse, so whether that's little uh, hydrogen fuel cell charging units or whatever it happens to be that we, we put on in the future it's difficult to predict where that will go um i think what one of the things that dan uh, who works with the city council dan turner has left but he's part of that um project to put infrastructure into places and i think um, at least one of the marinas uh, is part of that project um i'm not close enough to give you all the details of that but at least one of those is yeah. and you'll also find that mo most uh, marina berths have 16 amp commando sockets that are there. there's low round things and in most cases for a small vessel that's more than enough because if you look at how small leisure boats are used you know that they'll, they'll motor out in their berth and go into the Plymouth Sound in our case and then probably put the sails up and disappear for yes. a, you know, a few days or a day come yeah. back in again and then tie up and they're, they're not using many hours of engine that's so right. they could probably they could probably do that I accept entirely your point about having enough reserve in case of emergency so it's about getting that balance right. I, I get that. Um, Cheers for uh, but, uh, know, the, the, the rich potential. Yeah, thanks for that, Andy. Uh, we, we have thanks. overrun already, but George, George Lang has, uh, has got a question there for you. So maybe this should be uh, the last question uh, for this event. Thanks, George. Well, there's a couple of strands to it, um, but uh, here we go. My work with batteries has mainly been with uh, machinery, lithium ion batteries. and. Uh, yeah. As far as I'm concerned, there seems to be problems with the technology of lithium ion batteries, which will get evened up eventually. But I mean, we, we see problems with operating in um, high or low temperature environments. Uh, back life has become a problem. We also see heating up as well. They get quite hot. Um, and the other issue, of course, is, as you've just mentioned, is the infrastructure of the high ampage needed. Uh, maybe not if you're onto small vessels, but as you get onto bigger, I mean, I've, I've got caught up in that because I'm in a block of, and if we have to provide car charging for the car, uh, third parking space, uh, suddenly we're going to have to reconfigure from the grid into the block of flats. And, you know, the prices are hundreds of thousands of pounds to do that. So it, it, it's very, um, it's an issue at this stage of, um, Love uh, going green. Yeah, thank you, George. Um, thank you for, for that. I think the, the, the one about the temperature um, and the impact on uh, battery life as well. Um, so the 
the fortunate thing about uh, working on a boat is you're in a very stable temperature environment generally that's where we are in, in the uk you know the sea temperature does fluctuate but not massively so we talk about uh, temperature control rather than cooling and we're talking about battery management so uh, what we did on the uh, the e voyager and what we and i'll go beyond that what we planned is from based on what we learned there and what other people are doing is we, we used the heat exchanger and just circulated um, seawater into the heat exchanger and and fly column water around the, the batteries and the um, inverter and the rest of the kit that was there. Um, and, you know, you get a minimum temperature of what, seven, eight degrees probably, um, even on the surface. Um, in, in Plymouth, it's not going to be much lower than that. So we're not talking about freezing temperatures at all. Um, and so we were able to, to maintain that. Um, the other thing, I think the big difference between the way that vessels operate and the way that perhaps vehicles operate, is they tend to operate at a very moderate um, speed and in terms of the, their power out, but not always, and there are definite exceptions for that. But if we look at the displacement type um, holes, uh, which, you know, which are operating at fairly low revs because they're more economic than diesel, typically, uh, that works really well with batteries as well uh, because you're not loading the batteries up. And we found actually, we, we put a switch on the cooling pump uh, because the noisiest thing on the boat was this pump running. So you could hear that, whereas on a diesel engine, you'd never, ever hear the cooling pump because all you could hear was the diesel. So we had this little uh, annoying little pump pumping away in the background, which is circulating the uh, uh, seawater. So uh, we put a little switch on that, and we only put that on when the uh, temperature of the batteries or the inverters got too high. Uh, and as long as we ran at our hull uh, speed, or just fractionally below hull speed, we Firstly, never needed to put it on. Um, they, they remain at an ambient temperature. They don't overheat. They just they run at uh, sort of 10, 15 degrees, something like that, uh, which is slightly outside of their optimum, which would be you know, probably in the 20s. Uh, but it was really efficient. You know, it worked really well. So we, did, we didn't find cooling to be a big issue. As we moved forward, when we were looking at what we would do on one of the bigger vessels, um, one of the, the thoughts there was we wouldn't even have seawater cooling, we'd exclude seawater from it. Uh, and we, we'd use maybe something like keel cooling, internal keel cooling, um, or even a, uh, a tank um, to, to take up the load. Um, so we were exploring how we could actually use the benefits that we'd, we'd had from the smaller vessel or the larger vessel. If we can exclude seawater from the boat altogether, that's fantastic. Uh, keep seawater on the outside, it works really well. Um, and the, the second one you, you mentioned was, sorry, I'm going on forever here. The second one you were talking about was the supply um, and, and how to uh, deal with that, because you're absolutely right, getting supply in lots of these locations. And, you know, if we think about where the small commercial vessels operate, they're often in small uh, villages, towns, um, they're somewhere up the Tamar in a place which is not very accessible. Uh, how, how are we going to get decent infrastructure there at a reasonable cost? Well, I think one of the solutions may be that reuse of batteries. So where we've got batteries that may have been used in other industries for operating machinery, and they've come to a point where they may be only 80% of the power that they were at the beginning. And you're also, from your point of view, as, a, as an operator, that equipment is no longer adequate. And they can be repurposed and become energy storage. So you could trickle charge those from the supply that's already existing there, and then dump it as a DC, which means it's much faster in terms of getting onto the boat as well. So it has huge benefits. And then the other one I mentioned before is if you're doing that, then potentially you can support that local community, particularly perhaps in, in times of poor weather when it's uh, not suitable for the boats to be working, where they can actually feed power back into the community. Right. So you, you end up with a bit of a win-win there, potentially. You know, there's a lot to do to make that work, uh, but that's the way that we're, you know, we're starting to look at how we can use this. You, you mentioned noise there, <clears throat> and um, you also talked earlier about the propeller speeds uh, without the gearbox. Uh, of course, p pollution is not just oil or whatever. News noise pollution has always been a big issue for marine. Well, not always, but in the last decade or two. Um, I just wonder if, the, if those propellers you uh, you had designed uh, to run at was it twelve hundred RPM? Was it something like that? Sixteen hundred was the maximum. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do they, what are they like? Noise if they're turning that fast? Not an effect uh, or noticeable uh, effect we could hear the wash um yeah, right. so you couldn't hear the prop 
Uh, you could hear the you could hear the water pump, and you could hear the wash of the boat going past. Passengers absolutely love it. Anybody on that boat, uh, just it transformed the experience. Uh, so for, for I was thinking about vessels, the marine life. Yeah, um, that's the environmental uh, lobby. Yeah, one one of the um, owners was very keen to focus on could he could he fit it to one of his angling boats because he could imagine sneaking up on the sea bass. <laughs> well, we know who you're talking about, yeah. <laughs> yes, you can hear him Anything say to make it. Profit, as well. Yeah, yeah. Well, but that that's how quiet it is. Uh, you, you don't hear anything at all. Re really good, and I think. Um, one of the things that I think we, we would learn and as we should work on other boats, it's about focusing on some of those smaller things as well, about making sure you keep that noise as close to zero as you can do, um, because it becomes increasingly important. I, I do drive an electric car and it's really frustrating when you can hear a little tiny ticking noise or something, which you'd never ever hear in anything else. You, you can, what, what is that little noise, that tiny rattle? You've got to find it because you know, it's, it's just there. And I think it's important to do that as you, as you build uh, or design other vessels and try and actually yeah, work that out as well. Thanks. Well, okay, well, thanks thank, very much, George. Thank you very much for answering us, and Andy. Yeah, we have exceeded uh, over 15 minutes on, on the allotted time. It's, it's really uh, nice that uh, we've still got 14 participants with us, so thank you very much, and it, it is an enthralling subject. Um, many questions uh, still to be asked out there, but nonetheless, uh, it, it, for, for its appropriate use, I'm sure it's going to be uh, embedded as part of the maritime future. Um, I'd just like to put an advert out for those that are attending, if you wished a certificate uh, for, your, for your CPD, the yeah, Continuous Professional Development, please use the uh, email address, uh, my email address, gordonfootersky.com, and uh, I can provide you with a certificate. Uh, on behalf of the Nautical Institute Southwest England Branch, I'd like to thank uh, Andy Hurley for uh, absolutely fascinating uh, presentation there on our net zero maritime of the future. <clears throat> and uh, I don't know if Paul or, or Richard has got anything else to say, but uh, thank you very much, Andy. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Andy. No, uh, all I have to say, I don't think um, I don't think Richard's there. Just on behalf of the branch, uh, thank you very much indeed, uh, Andy, for your interesting talk. There's uh, obviously a great deal of interest in this uh, sort of act, uh, new, these new, new, or shall I say, uh, sort of developing technologies, uh, and there are some big challenges, you say. Uh, I'm sure they'll find their niche, uh, and I can see areas where the niche will be found. I'm not quite so convinced in my mind that they will be uh, sort of so uh, large that they'll be actually to overtake, to take on the uh, major sort of commercial uh, shipping. But, uh, you know, people have different ideas and things will move forward, yeah. So thank you very much indeed for an interesting and stimulating uh, talk. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Yeah, it's a pleasure everyone. to be here. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, for attending. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Um, I'm stopping the recording now, and here ends uh, the presentation. Thank you very much, Andy.